Ливии. Effects of Diving on the Brain by Jenna Wiley The question of whether diving can have deleterious, long-term health effects emerges from time to time but appears unanswered so far. Possible neurological complications from acute dive injuries are undisputed, but some studies show evidence of lesions in the central nervous system of divers with no history of decompression sickness. These subclinical lesions or white spots in the brain are detected with magnetic resonance imaging or MRI, a method very sensitive to changes in the brain. It is not clear whether they are more common in divers than in non-divers, nor is it certain that their presence has any importance. In some studies, measurements of neurological function also indicate abnormal results in divers. These measurements included neuropsychological assessments such as memory and concentration tests, electroencephalograms or EEGs which detect electrical activity in the brain, and single photon emission computer tomography or SPECT scans which measure cerebral blood flow. In the Geneva Memory Study by Slosman et al, reduction in cerebral blood flow and neuropsychological performance was associated with a history of high dive frequency meaning more than 100 dives per year, dive depths deeper than 30 meters, and cold water diving environments. Establishing a causal relationship to diving and determining the pathological mechanisms of these brain lesions is difficult, however. Factors such as age, history of head injury, alcohol consumption, migraines, smoking, hypertension, high blood cholesterol, infection and the presence of a PFO, or patent foramen ovale, appear associated with these findings. Often bubbles travelling through cardiac chambers and visualised using ultrasound do not cause any symptoms. These silent bubbles could, however, cause subclinical lesions. A few studies have focused on the influence of PFO, which is an opening between the right and left atria of the heart which can vary in size and is found in about 25% of the dive population. Bubbles formed as a result of decompression stress could theoretically travel from the systemic circulation of the heart, cross from the right side to the left through the PFO and enter the arterial circulation which includes potentially the brain. This mechanism mimics paradoxical embolism, that is in which a clot from a deep vein crosses through a PFO and ends up in the brain causing a stroke. Although the presence of PFO is considered a risk factor for brain lesions, so far there is no unequivocal evidence of a causal relationship between PFO and silent injuries. There is some additional information regarding breath hole divers, however. Breath hole divers exhibit central nervous system effects as well. Acute stroke-like injuries in breath hole divers are well documented. A Swedish study showed that prolonged voluntary apnea can transiently increase levels of brain damage marker protein, even in the absence of symptoms of acute injury. This publication by Anderson et al. showed that exposure to severe hypoxia could cause neurological damage over time. The risk of asymptomatic neurological events and their possible long-term effect in divers remains unresolved, however. So we've asked the experts. The first question, what if any evidence is there for brain lesions in divers without a history of decompression sickness? According to Richard Moon, some studies using MRI have observed a greater number of brain lesions in divers compared to non-divers but so far no relationship between the number of lesions and the number of dives has been established, which suggests that the lesions are not related to diving itself. Gunal Putsum adds to this that studies conducted in the last 20 years aimed at illuminating the presumed correlation between diving and brain lesions, and it has revealed conflicting results. Due to various method differences amongst the studies, it is not possible to pool all the data together to reach a clear conclusion. 
consistent with earlier reports, they found higher incidences of white matter lesions in asymptomatic military divers compared to non-diving controls. This was published by Erdem et al. in 2009. A positive correlation, however, does not always imply causation. In other words, just because one thing is found, together with another, does not mean that the one factor leads to the other. Most of these studies, including theirs, did not establish any significant relationship between white matter lesions and diving indices. Even if divers had increased numbers of white matter lesions, their clinical relevance and association with neuropsychological symptoms had not yet been clearly defined. Kate Tetzlove adds to this that there is an abundance of studies that investigated MRI in a variety of diving groups, and many of these reported associations between parameters of diving exposure and the presence of brain lesions on MRI. However, none could actually prove a causal relationship. A fundamental flaw in study design has been the possibility of selection bias, in that the lesions in selected divers could be pre-existing. In fact, studies could not disprove the possibility that the decision to start diving may in fact be the first sign of some level of brain damage. One way to reduce bias would be a longitudinal follow-up of a cohort of divers from the beginning of their diving career compared to a cohort of non-divers while controlling for the confounding factors such as alcohol intake, smoking, hypertension and the like. Such a study has yet to be reported. Second question. What is the relationship between PFO and brain lesions? Richard Moon says there's a weak relationship between the presence of PFO and the presence of brain lesions, but again there is no evidence that these lesions indicate brain damage. Utsun. So-called silent gas bubbles, which may be detected even after dives in shallow water, do not produce clinical symptoms and are generally filtered through the pulmonary vasculature. A PFO, which is an opening between the right and left atria, may serve as an entry point for silent gas bubbles into the arterial circulation and it is hypothesized that these bubbles can interrupt small blood vessels in the brain and cause white matter brain lesions. Indeed, a number of studies demonstrates that divers with a PFO seem to have an increased risk for white matter lesions compared to divers without PFOs. But there is yet no general recommendation that asymptomatic scuba divers should undergo examinations for PFOs. If a diver has a known PFO, use conservative dive profiles to reduce the risk of DCS. Tetzlaff. A PFO increases the risk of decompression illness and thereby may also enhance brain lesions on MRI. And it has been established from a clinical study that divers with a PFO have a 4.5-fold increase in DCI events and twice the incidence of ischemic brain lesions compared to those divers without a PFO this study by Schwertzmann et al. in 2001. However, it should be noted that diving even with a PFO is considered safe when dives are performed according to the guidelines. Note, it's not the PFO that causes injury, but the presence of gas bubbles during or after the dive. The bubble load can be minimized by avoiding risk factors such as deep dives, cold dives and decompression dives. Third question, what are other possible mechanisms of formation of brain lesions known as white spots? Richard Moon says they could be related to normal aging processes just as a result of changes in blood vessels. Utsun says white spots of the brain observed in MRI are actually common in elderly patients and may be associated with head injuries, alcohol consumption, migraines, smoking, hypertension or high blood cholesterol. In general, it's accepted that white matter lesions represent parenchymal damage, that is, cortical or tissue damage of the brain, due to cerebrovascular disorders or cerebral ischemia. Tetzlaff. White matter hyperintensities are regarded as typical MRI expressions of cerebral small vessel disease. Pathological correlates are varied 
with most pointing towards white matter hyperintensities as a reflection of small vessel ischemic burden. The predominant clinical associations are with stroke, cognitive impairment and dementia. The prevalence of white matter intensities does increase with age. Fourth question. What is the relationship between reduced neuropsychological performance and the presence of brain lesions? Moon. So far none has demonstrated any such relationship in divers. Utsun. The presence of brain lesions does not always reflect a reduction in neuropsychological performance. However, some studies have established a correlation between white matter lesions and cognitive impairment in older adults, and some others suggested that periventricular white matter lesions were predictive of future development of dementia. On the other hand, studies assessing the relationship between brain lesions and neuropsychological performance in divers failed to demonstrate any correlation. Tetzlaff. Impaired executive functioning and memory have been found to be significantly associated with white matter brain lesions. Next question. How do voluntary apnea and hypoxic states relate to potential brain damage in breath hole divers? Richard Moon. When breath hole divers reach the surface, their blood oxygen levels are often low, that is hypoxemia, which causes some breath hole divers to lose consciousness for a few seconds. It's certainly conceivable that repetitive hypoxic episodes like these could cause cumulative brain damage. Utsun. A few studies have investigated brain damage in breath hole divers. A recent study by Anderson et al. in 2009 reported an increase in serum levels of S100B protein, a marker of neural damage, immediately after voluntary apnea. The authors postulated that hypoxia-induced neural damage or temporary impairment in blood-brain barrier function could account for this finding. Whether voluntary apnea causes cerebral damage in the long term is yet to be determined, however. Tetzlaff. Prolonged breath holding will reduce oxygenation of the brain. There is evidence from the field of obstructive sleep apnea that intermittent hypoxia is associated with cognitive decline and silent brain infarcts which predominantly involve small blood vessels in the brain. However, unlike patients with obstructive apnea, breath hole divers do not appear to develop permanent, sympathetic or any significant reflex cardiovascular activation. The increase in serum levels of protein S100B, the brain damage marker, after extreme apnea appears in elite breath hole divers and may point to likely disruption of the blood-brain barrier but is a non-specific marker in terms of extracranial injury. Extreme apneas as they are performed by these divers do cause significant stress on the cardiovascular and respiratory systems and it should be noted that extreme breath hole diving is a dangerous activity that can cause other serious health hazards amongst which long-term brain damage is the least worrisome perhaps. What risks are there to the central nervous system related to a person who dives? Richard Moon. Well, the main risk, although low, is cerebral decompression illness. This could be due to decompression sickness, that is, in situ bubble formation in tissues, producing bubbles in blood vessels that could reach the brain. It may also be caused by arterial gas embolism, or AGE, where bubbles result from rupture of lung sacs or alveoli in the lung during decompression caused by breath holding or lung disease. Utsun. Scuba diving is associated with a number of neurological risks including DCS, AGE, anoxia and high pressure nervous syndrome. Tetzlaff. The major mechanism leading to central nervous system damage from diving is through gas embolism of arterial cerebral vessels. This can be caused acutely by arterial gas embolism following pulmonary barotrauma or spillover of venous gas emboli to the arterial circulation, as in the case of a possible PFO. Also silent embolism of cerebral microvessels by inert gas bubbles may cause chronic injury. As a result, uneventful diving and diving within no decompression limits should minimize the risk of central nervous system damage related to diving. 
Should scuba divers with no history of decompression sickness be concerned about cumulative injuries from diving? Richard Moon? Simply, no. Uzun? No, there is currently no convincing evidence that scuba diving causes long-term cerebral damage in asymptomatic divers. Tetzlaff? There is no need to worry. As outlined above, ischemic cerebral vessel disease may occur as a consequence of gas bubbles arising from diving. But diving within recommended limits and following recommended procedures should prevent such injuries. Current research is underway. To better understand the effects of diving on the brain, researchers at DAN are beginning a study that will screen divers for acute effects of scuba diving on executive brain functions. Executive functions include regulatory and control processes such as planning, problem solving, verbal reasoning, and the initiation and monitoring of actions. The study will use two psychometric tests, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment and the Clock Drawing Test. The CDT will employ a digital pen developed by the Clock Consortium, an association created by researchers at Massachusetts Institute for Technology and the LaHaye Clinic. The objective of the study is to assess possible neurological dysfunction after extreme breath hole diving and deep scuba diving in asymptomatic divers. Tests such as the Montreal Cognitive Assessment help researchers detect mild neurological impairment. Extreme breath holding diving may contribute to long-term brain damage, but the data so far are inconclusive.